we finished off, um, kind of capped up the heart, the pump of the body, but I want to continue on with the arteries just a little bit, and then we'll move into blood. Uh, so at the neck, on either side are the carotid arteries, which you can feel, or what, the word that we use is palpate. On either side of, uh, at, on either side, right or left of the groin, the femoral artery, and at the wrist, the radial artery. We also have the brachial artery, uh, which lies about right here uh, inside the uh, elbow, on the inner part or anterior portion of the elbow. And then, so you can see those three major ones there on the diagram. Uh, this diagram's in your book also. Remember that arteries always take blood away from the heart. Veins always bring blood back to the heart. And so we have a very small vessel in between the arteries and the veins called capillaries. And those capillaries are very thin-walled vessels, and I think of them as Swiss cheese because that's where your gas exchange takes place. In the alveoli, in the lungs themselves, or in all parts of the body, all the tissues and organs that need to be oxygenated by that, that uh, blood that's carrying oxygen. And so in those thin wall vessels, the, the um, gas molecules, the oxygen can leave the vessel to oxygenate those tissues as well as pick up carbon dioxide to take that back to the lungs. So we think of the circulatory system as arteries leaving the heart, uh, gas exchange in the capillaries, and then um, bringing blood back to the heart via the veins. And we'll cover this again you know, when we get into the shock module and bleeding, uh, but when these vessels um, become lacerated, you can kind of tell which one is, is um, injured, which one has been opened based on the, how the blood is coming out of the body. So an artery, because you can feel that pulse there, and, and uh, it's under high pressure, that left ventricle spitting that blood out, um, that blood will be very bright red because it contains oxygen and spurt with each heartbeat. You can actually count on heartbeat with it. You shouldn't. You should occlude the vessel, but you could. Whereas veins flow darker blood. It's a dark red blood um, as far as a color, and it flows out of the body. There won't be any spurting. And then capillaries, just a little finger prick or an abrasion or something like that, they kind of ooze blood. So you can tell what vessel's been injured by how the body is bleeding. Capillaries are going to be your smallest vessels, and, the, and uh, veins carry blood back to the heart. What does it carry? Well, it carries blood, and blood has several components. Plasma is the fluid portion of blood, the fluid portion, so it makes up the majority of the blood volume. But of all the cells, red blood cells account for about 97% of all the blood cells. And its job, red blood cells, is to carry oxygen as well as carbon dioxide. So red blood cells give blood its color. It's red. White blood cells fight infection. If you ever think about it, if you've ever had a wound, a small wound, get infected, and it has a little pus to it, when you rupture that, it comes out very white. Well, it's dead white blood cells is what pus is. So... Um, white blood cells actually work like Pac-Man and engulf and digest uh, the invading bacteria. So they fight infection. Platelets, when activated, will start clumping together. So that's a good thing if you have a laceration to the artery and you want to stop that bleeding. They clump together to um, protect that hole, protect that opening out of the vessel. Uh, sometimes we'll learn in myocardial infarctions or heart attacks that that clumping together is not always a good thing. So four components of blood, uh, plasma being the fluid part, and then the uh, red, white, and platelets of the cells. Moving into the skeletal system, and um, there's 206 bones of the body. Do you need to know all of them? Well, the more you know the correct name for, um, the more we speak the same language. So that's good. But you do need to understand the skeletal system is made up of bones and joints and ligaments and tissues that give us our support, our structure. It also helps protect vital organs and uh, in the bone marrow of bones it produces red blood cells. The skeletal system, the more bones you know the better. So if you want to spend some time studying this, if you want to do your flashcards in your interactive uh, Jones and Bartlett uh, resources, uh, or uh, I like flashcards. On one side of the flashcard, you write the name of the bone. On the other side, you write what it is. You hand those cards to somebody, and, and they study with you. And that, that makes a real good study um, technique. 
but we'll go over some of the bones. Um, the skull um, is kind of think of putting a helmet on and that's the skull, whatever that helmet would cover. And then we have the facial bones. So the only movable bone in the whole head is going to be that lower jaw bone. And we call that the mandible, the mandible. We have joints that connect here, sometimes those get injured. Or if somebody has a clicking, then they have an injury to their temporomandibular joint. We just call it TMJ, it makes more sense that way. And then that upper jawbone then is called the maxilla. We think of maximum being on top of it. And the rest of it we just kind of call the skull. Uh, and it supports the structure for the head, but it also protects the brain. It works much like a helmet. Down the skeletal system of the spine, which, which kind of connects the head all the way to the, uh, the uh, axial skeleton, the, the head and the trunk itself, the spine. It consists of 33 vertebrae. It kind of depends on whose book you read. Um, there's uh, the cervical, but when you get down to the bottom two, and I'll show you these, are fused together, and that's where the, the indiscrepancies come. But for the most part, we'll say 33 vertebrae. And these spinal vertebrae are stacked one on top of the other, held together by muscles and tendons and discs and ligaments. And you'll notice in our lectures, we add lifting and moving very early on in the preparatory phase, even though it's chapter 18, because one of the big uh, disablers of EMS responders are back injuries. And we want to discuss that very early on before you learn improper lifting and maybe even injure yourself in class. So we're going to cover that very soon so we prevent back injuries as much as we can. The spinal cord actually pa is a, passes through a hole in each of those spinal vertebrae. The spinal cord connects the brain to the rest of the body and it's an information highway. It sends information from the body of the body saying to the brain, I'm cold, I need to be warm or from the brain sending information to move my arms or whatever, but it it's transmits information. It has five sections, the cervical of the neck, and there's seven of those, the thoracic spine. We have 12 pairs of ribs, and they connect posteriorly in the back to the thoracic spine. The lower back is called the lumbar, and there's five of those, sacrum are four, and coccyx is also four. So. That's where we get the 33, but the lower two, the sacrum and the coccyx, are fused together. The sacrum connects to the pelvic girdle, uh, connects posteriorly to that. If you want to remember these sections in order, uh, you don't necessarily have to remember the numbers, but in order would be nice to know that neck injuries and lower back injuries are probably the biggest um, types of spinal injuries that you'll have uh, as far as those sections. And I don't take credit for this. One of my students came up with this acronym, and uh, it, I guess it was very flattering, but he took those letters C-T-L-S-C, and he came up with the acronym Can't Think Like Susie Can, and that helped him remember it. And I, I've used that to teach ever since then, and a lot of people will say, yeah, that makes sense. Now I remember the exact order of uh, the spinal cord sections or the spinal column sections. And you can see posteriorly how it looks, um, not so much connecting the brain, but the spinal cord connects um, from the brain through uh, the back of the body into that, uh, that opening in the spinal column itself. And then the skull will actually sit there on a cervical bone number one. It doesn't really turn much, so the cervical bone number two kind of allows us that first turning um, of the vertebrae. Moving on down we have the shoulder girdles and they're comprised of three bones. The collarbone is also known as the clavicle, shoulder blade, and you have two of them, two collarbones and two clavicles, um, or two shoulder blades and two collarbones. The scapula, and one way to remember these are collarbone begins with the letter, e, uh, letter C, clavicle begins with letter C. Shoulder blade begins with letter S, scapula begins with letter S. Maybe an easy way to remember that. And then the upper arm bone, which is the humerus. Uh, the whole upper arm bone is one bone, only one, and it's called the humerus. And I think of it like this. If you ever hit your elbow and you hit that funny bone and you say, well, that wasn't very funny. Well, although it's not the humerus, we think of maybe the distal end of the humerus and it maybe helps us remember that that's the humerus. Although it's really 
uh, that nerve that runs over, they all know that you're hitting when that happens. The forearm, so the lower arm has two bones called the radius and the ulna. The radius is on the thumb side and it rotates around the ulna. The ulna is actually a longer bone. And then we have the wrist bones, the hand bones, and you can count how many fingers you have. Hopefully you have five. And you have five hand bones um, because you have five fingers. So wrist bones and then the five hand bones and then the, uh, the fingers, the digits. And we have joints within the, the fingers, uh, so you'd actually have about 14 of those. Uh, the, under the rib cage, moving from the extremities back into the axial skeleton, into the thorax, there's 12 pairs of ribs. And again, those are semi-movable as we breathe. We can see uh, the intercostal muscles moving that rib cage out. Uh, but the big thing it does is it protects the heart, the lungs, uh, the liver, and the spleen, which are tucked up on either side in the uh, lower part of that chest cavity. The most frequently um, injured are going to be ribs 6 through 10. So if you look at this, this diagram here, uh, ribs 1, 2, 3, 4, 5 and a little bit into the 6, but 1 through 5 connect directly to the bone right here called the sternum, the breastbone. It's connected with cartilage. Anytime two bones connect together, it's connected with cartilage. So if you ever had to do CPR compressions on somebody, that first compression you'll feel the cracking of the cartilage, much like when knuckles are, are popped or cracked. Um, those aren't broken bones, those are just making those ribs move a little bit further than what they're used to or that sternum move a little bit uh, further than what it's used to. So that breastbone is called the sternum and at the very distal end, so inferiorly, is a little spinous process called the xiphoid process. If your hands are placed too low on the sternum, that breaks right off, it goes right into the liver. Uh, bones when they break are very jagged, so the continued compressions cause knife-like penetrations into the liver and while you're doing compressions you won't know it but during the autopsy not a good outcome they'll find that they actually died of a lacerated liver rather than the cardiac arrest so you want to be real careful with your hand placement when you do chest compressions but you'll notice that the rib cage does move some it is somewhat pliable um, not really meant to do that but it can and we get down here and we look at ribs six seven eight nine and ten and they connect to what we call the intercostal arch. All of this blue here is um, cartilage. And then the very last two are called floating ribs, 11 and 12. And if you're thin enough, you can reach on the lateral side and you can feel that little point, and that is rib 11. It's a lot harder to feel rib 12. And that's the rib cage. Each uh, rib is lined with an intercostal muscle, which allows us to expand that chest a little bit better. The pelvis is comprised of three bones. The ilium, the ischium, the bone we sit on, there's two of them, and then the pubic symphysis, was, which brings that pelvic girdle together anteriorly. Uh, really takes a lot of force to break the pelvis. In fact, when most people have what we call a hip fracture, we're really looking at that they have a femur fracture. It's just a very proximal or superior end of that, um, that uh, femur that was fractured and since it's part of the hip area, we call it a, a, a hip fracture, even though it's a lower extremity, which is the pelvic, which is a, the femur fracture. That thigh bone is gonna be the longest and strongest bone. It's hard to break. It's also very long, hard for it to heal. It takes a long time for it to heal. The, leg has, the lower leg has two bones in, the tibia and the fibula. Your shin bone then is the tibia, and then that lateral supporting bone is the fibula. I've seen fibulas um, shoot out of the leg. Somebody falls, uh, I've seen people fall off a horse and that that foot turns this way so at the ankle the fibula shoots right out of their boot uh, just keeps on going and shoots out of that ankle. Um, so it's a little bit longer of a bone and more of a supportive than the strong uh, tibial bone. Kneecap is also called a patella and some people sometimes can get some dislocations and that patella, patella can shift one way or the other. Uh, pretty painful. Um, most of the time an orthopedic surgeon can pop those bones back into place without going to surgery. Um, sometimes they'll have to go to surgery.
We've got the ankle bones, the foot bones, the same thing, five toes. So you have five uh, foot bones and then the smaller bones of the toes. Can be very painful when somebody breaks a toe, uh, but for the most part, if it's non-displaced, if it's not crooked, jagged, they can tape them back together much like the fingers and they pretty much heal on their own. Not a whole lot that you can do for those. Where two bones come together, there's a joint. And uh, anytime that there's a joint, there's padding called cartilage that uh, pads between those two bones. As we age, some of that padding becomes um, less thick and uh, can cause some problem where then they're actually bone on bone. And those joints are held together by tendons and ligaments. So here's a way to remember it. A joint would make like, I'll do it at my elbow, makes like an L. So we think of a, a ligament being there to hold those two bones together. Ligaments hold bone to bone. And tendons, I think of a real tough guy, very muscular. Um, so tendons hold the muscles to the bone. And either one of those can tear. If a ligament tears, we call it a temporary or a dislocation. And then uh, if a tendon tears, then they have more of a muscular injury. If um, there's not gross deformity, you look at the arm and it's swollen, there's not a whole lot of deformity, we don't really know unless you have x-ray vision if it's fractured or if it's sprained or if it's dislocated. Um, so it's best just to say everything is a possible fracture until proven otherwise. Of course, if you see a bone sticking out, then you can say, well, I have a bone sticking out. It must be fractured. All of the, um, all of the bones and the joints and the muscles are lubricated. And uh, as we age, again, that lubricant kind of uh, diminishes. Three types of joints. There's fused joints, much like the skull. So uh, an infant will not have fused skull bones, and that allows that, that to, to kind of expand if the brain ever swole or anything. You can kind of tell from that soft spot on top of the head, on top of a baby's head, that those bones aren't fully fused together yet, and they don't until the baby's about 18 months. Then you've got other types of joints. You've got your hinge joints, which we think of a door opening and closing. So like the elbow and the knee, hinge joints, the finger, nice hinge joints. And then we've got ball and socket joints. And the best two examples are at the shoulder for a ball and socket joint and at the hip. You can actually go 360 degrees if you were limber enough uh, to move those joints in that direction. A lot of material on the skeletal system. Um, and I'm just going to cover briefly the muscular system because just like the pulmonary system and the circulatory system, we call it the cardiopulmonary, we think of the skeletal system with the muscles because otherwise we would just be bones and not moving. The muscular system actually supports the skeletal system in providing not only support but movement. So we call it the muscular skeletal system. And again, we'll cover both of these in trauma as we talk about soft tissue injuries as well as um, bone and orthopedic injuries. Uh, so skeletal muscles are what we call voluntary muscles. They're attached to the skeletal and we have to think about moving them. I mean, I think about moving my hands back and forth. It's voluntary. Unlike that diaphragm that I don't even have to think about making it move. Uh, voluntary. I can hit play on here and you can see how the brain sends a message to the arm for the arm to move just like that. Other muscles within the muscular system are smooth muscles and those work uh, pretty much involuntarily. Uh, so aside from the diaphragm we've also got the pupils. We go outside it's very bright and the pupils get small to let less light in. We come inside where it's dark and the pupils dilate to let more light in. The gastrointestinal system works involuntary. If you had to sit here all day and think about well I just ate let me sit here and digest my food down you know that would be kind of a waste of time. Unfortunately the GI tract works involuntary sometimes when you don't want it to. And cardiac muscle is the only one that really works automatically. All of the others still require the brain to give it some impulses, but the cardiac muscle works completely involuntary. So this is a good time to finish part two on here. I don't like any of the lectures to go very long, um, so we'll pick up where we left off.